All right, welcome to NDC. That was cool. Yeah, right. Thank you. Much better. Let's start with a little video. I'm thinking of the incredible breakthrough which has been made possible by developments in communications, particularly the transistor and, above all, the communication satellite. These things will make possible a world in which we can be in instant contact with each other, wherever we may be, where we can contact our friends anywhere on Earth, even if we don't know their actual physical location. It will be possible in that age, perhaps only 50 years from now, for a man to conduct his business from Tahiti or Bali just as well as he could from London. In fact, if it proves worthwhile, almost any executive skill, any administrative skill, even any physical skill, could be made independent of distance. So that was Arthur C. Clarke 60 years ago predicting the internet, which of course he had no idea what it would actually look like back at that time. And I think what's fascinating about it is that the things that we've ended up creating with the internet have allowed us to do so many amazing things with so little. Now, he couldn't really predict the internet as it is today. He certainly couldn't predict things like COVID, the global pandemic, where we in this industry got to thrive, not just survive, more so than just about any other. Because of this ability to do so much with so little, this multiplier we have where small amounts of effort can create massive things in technology and particularly in software development. Now, I think I've got some experience with that. I built this. Who's used have I been playing before? Okay, well, that's going to make things easy. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much everyone. In case you haven't, have I been playing as a data breach aggregation service? So when there's a data breach, and your data floats out there over the web, I get it, I put it in that site and I make it searchable. Who's been in a data breach before? Who's been in Dropbox? LinkedIn? Ashley Madison? <laughs> There's like one guy at the back. And it's, it's always a guy, every single time. Which of course is not surprising because you look at the nature of a website that's designed for people to have affairs and you go, oh, it's, it's gonna be guys, isn't it? You know? And we know that since the data breach happened because we have access to the data. And this is the fascinating thing about breaches. They peel back the cover of the website and you get to see all the mechanics internally. And what we learned from Ashley Madison is that a huge number of the women on the site signed up for my IP address 127.0.0.1. So they were bots, they were created by the system. So we learned all these interesting things. And Ashley Madison was just one of 777 different data breaches that are in there as of today. 13 and a half billion records. And going back to this theme about being able to do massive things with small amounts of input, just one little thing that I noticed only this week was really interesting, was the number of services using the pwned passwords feature. So there's a feature where when passwords appear in data breaches, we aggregate them, we put them all in a list, and there's an anonymity model where websites can check to see if a password has been used before, and then they can try and stop their customers from using things that are floating around. Earlier this week, I noticed this website. This is TradingView. And it was kind of curious because I, I saw TradingView pop up there as one of the top referrers for the anonymity API. And I found that 200,000 times a day, they hit this service the phone password service to check if someone's using a bad password. I like this password, the one you see in the red. The reason I like it, it's a good password, right? Uppercase, lowercase, number, non-alphanumeric, and eight characters long. What's wrong? Should be good. It's just been in loads and loads of data breaches. So they check that, and you can see in the dev tools, you can see the request from client side. So I figure it's okay to talk about it because it's literally there in the dev tools. Now that service, speaking about how big things get, the Pwn password service at the moment is hit more than eight and a half billion times a month, which did escalate kind of quickly. It's not what I expected originally. And when I first created Have I Been Pwn in December 2013, 
I wrote a blog post about how much it was costing to do really big things. And I said, for 100 gig of storage, I can hit it 10 million times and cost me $8. Well, that's nuts. You know, any of us can go and build this. You know, we can do it much cheaper now too, because this was 10 years ago, cloud's gotten cheaper. And the theme that kept coming up as I was preparing this keynote about what is it that makes this so cool is the leverage that we get. We get amazing leverage as software developers to be able to achieve so much with so little. And thinking back to that video at the start, you know, what the internet has become is giving us that leverage. And I think that the theme of leverage keeps applying over so many of the different things we do, including being here today. So being in communities gives us a huge amount of leverage. Being here at NDC gives you access to so much information and to so many people. And it might take you all sorts of places you haven't yet expected. So for me, I first started hearing about NDC about 13 years ago. And the reason I heard about it was from these guys. It was Richard Campbell and Carl Franklin. And every day when I drive to work, I'd be listening to .NET Rocks and they'd talk about NDC. And they'd talk about this stadium here and the fishbowl where they recorded .NET Rocks and all the other sort of Norwegian things. And that to me just seemed like a dream. Like what if I could go to NDC one day? And eventually in 2014, uh, I submitted a paper Call for paper, they call it a talk. This is what I'd like to talk about. Not expecting to get any result, but I did. I got an email from Jacob, and Jacob sent me over this and said, yeah, that'd be cool. You know, come to Norway and have a chat. Now, I'm Australian, so this was me at the time, back then. <laughs> it's much easier to create this stuff than what it was 10 years ago. You know what I like about this? I just went into ChatGPT and like, oh, just make a picture of me in Australia, and it knew that there'd be a barbecue with prawns, and with no prompting whatsoever, it gave me a beer. <laughs> I don't know what that is up in the tree. That's <laughs> we will come back to the whole AI thing. And I was coming to Norway, which was very exciting because I knew it would be like this. And uh, I knew there'd be moose and curling and aurora borealis. So I knew it was June. I didn't care. <laughs> Snow and stuff everywhere. Because this is the opinion. Like, you've probably got some really interesting opinions about Australia. This is what I expected from Norway. So I came here and I did this talk, How I Hacked My Way to Norway. And it was the first time I'd ever done a talk outside of Australia. And it was all the way over here. And it was, it was daunting, much more so than having a keynote with thousands of people there, I've got to be honest. Anyway, so I turned up and then this was the room. And I was stunned because there's like people sitting on the stairs, people sitting on the floors, people all the way up the halls. It was absolutely packed. And I did the talk and apparently it was okay. Like everyone was really happy about it. And I just wanted to take a moment to talk about because that, that was 10 years ago. And I got this amazing leverage out of community, out of being here at NDC. I think I did really well out of NDC 2014 because I also got a wife. <laughs> I married the NDC project manager and that's just an entirely personal note. But I don't know whether you're going to get the same outcome from your time here today. If you do, good on you, that's a good result. Maybe, <laughs> depending on your circumstances. And the cool thing about this as well is that the guy there marrying us is Richard Campbell, the one who got me so interested in coming here in the first place. I think he's somewhere out there, so I'll go and thank him for that later on. So community, enormous leverage. It allows us to do massive things. And for me, a lot of the massive things with software started with this book. So this is how I learned to write software for the web. Literally an HTML for dummies book. And it seems really stupid to look at it now. But that was the book that I bought in 1995. It was the year that I'd started university and I started computer science and the web had only really just emerged as we know it. And I thought, oh, I will go and I'll do a web development course because, yes, yeah, university, why not? Problem is there's no web development course. It's 1995, no one's built a web development course yet. We're only just building the building blocks of the web itself. So I went and got the For Dummies book, and everything that I do today with Have I Been Pwned began 
just from a little book like that. And again, this, this theme of the leverage is so strong with all of our ability to do this. Now, whether it's a book or you go online and you do Pluralsight courses or other learning things, we can do so much with very minimal amounts of education in this industry. Now, I bought that book from a local bookseller in Australia called Dimix for 60 bucks, which seems like a lot 30 years ago. But anyway, that's the book I got. And one of the sort of fascinating things I find over the course of time is how many coincidences we end up having later on. So the knowledge I got from the book that I bought at Dimix allowed me to build Have I Been Pwned, which then helped me load the Dimix data breach <laughs> the other day. Now, I, I don't think that was originally what they had expected, but here we were. So the fascinating thing is, is all of that took me to great heights where Have I Been Pwned is today. But that's not what I always wanted to do speaking of great heights, what I wanted to do was this. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be a pilot. And the name on the helmet says Hunt, but it's not me, it's my father. And for the first time ever, my father is here actually watching one of my talks, so this better be good. <laughs> I wanted to be a pilot because I thought that would be a really cool thing. But think about how different that would be as a course to our industry today. I mean, our industry today, you can go through and break the build, doesn't matter. What if you break the build if you're an airline or Air Force pilot in the 70s? Well, you, you crash, you die. Test and production, eh, maybe not so much. We can do that. We can experiment, we can break things. The worst case scenarios for us are very, very minor compared to the worst case scenario when you're flying an Air Force jet. So my father went on and he flew airliners, passenger jets all the way around the world, and the, the recollection I always have as a kid is my mum would constantly say, Dad's studying, you know, be quiet, Dad's got to study. Constant checks, constant assessments of his health, obviously his flying ability, his mental capacity. Nobody wants a crazy pilot, right? So he continually had to get assessed. And again, think about how different it is for us. We have such a luxury. Who's coded drunk before? Right, him, can't do that job drunk. <laughs> very, very different set of circumstances. So dad flew in the, in the airline industry for decades. And eventually, just towards the end of his career, on his very last flights, this happened to his plane. This is a real photo. He had a high pressure turbine blade, developed a crack, burst out through the side of the plane, set the engine on fire. There's a mountainous area in Japan and he's just taken off. So he has to shut the engine down because the engine's on fire. So 767, so he now has half the engine. There's two engines. And 767 flies the airplane around with the engine on fire, lands it, everyone's okay. Now imagine if he had to learn his career the way we learn ours. Would you want to be on that plane? <laughs> and again, we have such good access to knowledge and education that allow us to do our jobs in such an easy fashion compared to the, the rigors that many other professions have to go through. And, and one of the things I really love about technology and software development is I often say it's very much a meritocracy. You get treated solely on what you can do. People care a lot less about what you did or what degrees and things you achieved. I eventually dropped out of that university course. Worked out okay. So everyone has access to this regardless of your demographic and regardless of your age. These days there's kids doing talks at NDC. This is my 11 year old daughter. Tomorrow she's gonna do a talk on 3D printing. If you're here as a technology professional that might've been doing it for decades like me and you go to that talk, you'll learn things that you've never seen before because a child has so much access to information these days that they can become professional and competent at what they do. And I think this is very exciting, and you know, for, for you, Al, when you do this talk tomorrow, you come behind a lot of other very successful young people. There was a very handsome young man a while back, and he created some really good stuff. He actually created Clippy, and later on went to become a dancer. <laughs> now, he did some other stuff that was kind of good as well. 
And there is a long line of people that have been very successful at a very young age because they've had access to technology. Again, so much more so than pretty much any other industry you can think of. Now, so much of this centers around code. I love the idea of code being leverage, of being able to sit there and write things that get put in front of the world and achieve massive things. And in the back of my head, I keep coming back to Have I Been Pwned because it was never meant to be a big thing. It was a little thing with a tiny, tiny bit of investment, a seed that grew. And I was thinking as I prepared this, Have I Been Pwned is basically the only successful project I've ever done. I did a lot of stuff beforehand that was terrible. And I went back through my archives and I found the earliest one I could locate, which was this. It's the highest quality image I could find <laughs> from the 90s. And the idea of e-cars was back when the web was very new, I thought I should create a platform where you can buy and sell cars. And then as a consumer, you can come to the website and you can decide buying, selling, find a match and the transaction's done. I found the website, I found the code, I still have it locally. It looks like this. Now, who's laughing? <laughs> if, if you weren't building websites in the 90s, we didn't have rounded corners then, all right? That came later, much, much later. It was actually very lightweight when I went back and looked at it. But yeah, one of the interesting things about it is you go back and look at the HTML, and then you look at what we write today, and so it's, a lot of it's very similar. For some reason, all the tags were uppercase rather than lowercase. So I kind of feel like that's a tabs versus spaces debate. Just looked a bit odd. But anyway, you go onto the website, choose whether you're a buyer or a seller, and you progress from there. But one of the other wonderful things we had in the 90s when we were building web applications that I just don't see around very much anymore is we had MIDI files. Now, if you weren't building websites in the 90s or even using them in the 90s, and you want to know what that looks like, as you were browsing around on this website, deciding whether you're going to buy or sell, you'd have some thinking music that was playing in the background. Now, I don't know why this site was never successful. <laughs> it never went anywhere. And that's kind of the point. Like, I built something and nothing happened with it, and that's fine because I learned a bunch of things and frankly, I had fun building it too. Many other things before Have I Been Pined went nowhere as well. One of the ones probably sort of in the middle of those two was this one, a safer web. And a safer web is the automated security analyzer for ASP.NET. And all I wanted to do was be able to analyze the security configuration posture of an ASP.NET website based on a URL. Now, things like, have you configured your custom errors properly? So you'd go and put in a URL, you'd click scan, it'd check it, come back with the result. I never made a single cent of money out of that site. I pumped money in to be able to do it because it was fun. I'd go to my day job and I'd write code all day and then I'd come home and go, I feel like writing code. <laughs> you know, I want to go and create something. And I think this is another aspect of our industry that is so powerful, where so many of us are just passionate about being around technology and being around code, that it allows us to experiment and create big things. I've got a friend who's a, a dentist, and I was talking to him the other day, and I said, uh, what happens after you've been at work? Well, you know, you're at work, you're in the surgery all day. Do you come home and just like want to practice on the dog? Or like, what do you do? You know, are you really interested in pursuing your career once you get back home? He says, no, you know, I want to do the gardening, play with the kids, you know, <laughs> like other stuff like that. So we have a passion that seems to drive many of us to want to keep doing this, not because we have to, but because we love to. A good example of that for me is I got right into Home Assistant, particularly when COVID hit. Who's used Home Assistant before? Okay, that's actually a healthy subsection, that's good. Home Assistant is the second most active open source repository on GitHub after VS Code. That's by a number of contributors. It's massive and the value proposition of Home Assistant is it's IoT software that works with everything and is accessible to everyone. It's obviously open source, so that's free. And unlike Apple HomeKit, Google Home, the Amazon Alexa things, all the rest of it, 
this is not a proprietary walled garden ecosystem where everything gets locked in. It's designed to interact with every other possible thing that it can. It runs on a Raspberry Pi. So what are you looking at? Like 100 bucks to get up and running with a full home automation suite that updates many times per month as well. And when you think about things like, if anyone's seen like CBUS home automation systems before, you're lucky if they start at thousands of dollars, they're probably tens of thousands of dollars. They're massively expensive. But if you're happy to live in the maker world, you can go and get Home Assistant. You've probably got a Raspberry Pi laying around somewhere already anyway. And you can get going. Now, the value proposition of Home Assistant is it ties in all of these different independent little parts of an IoT ecosystem. So for example, these. I love these. I've got a bunch of these at home. These are little temperature sensors. But they don't just do temperature. They're really little weather stations. They do temperature, humidity, and pressure. So think about the stuff you can do once you can measure these things. Measuring humidity, for example. You can put these in a bathroom so that when the shower goes on, you can raise an event and say, OK, well, the shower is now humid. Maybe I need to then go and turn on a fan. They're tiny. They fit in the palm of your hand. They take a CR2032 battery. They last between one and two years. The battery, that is. You just cycle the battery, thing keeps going. They connect via Zigbee, so a different protocol to having a Wi-Fi connection, and they connect back to a Zigbee radio controller on your home assistant. But you can then go and buy other devices that are also Zigbee powered, that Zigbee mains powered, things like Philips Hue, probably one of the most popular well-known IoT lights out there. You don't have to pair it to the hub, the Philips Hue hub, and become dependent on their walled garden you can pair it straight back to Home Assistant, and because it's a mains-powered Zigbee device, it becomes a repeater, and they create a mesh network. So as you start to put more Philips here around the house, they all talk to each other, and then you can put your little temperature sensors in some distant location, and it talks through the light bulbs back to the Raspberry Pi. How cool is that? That's awesome just saying that. Another thing I've got a lot of is these. These are IoT relays. So relays are just able to toggle the power on and off. And they're called a Shelly. So imagine you've got lights in your house. <laughs> Most of you probably got lights in your house. You've got light switches, but you want to add internet and automation. Rather than either replacing the lights or replacing the switches, you can get smart versions, you can get one of these and you put it in just behind the switch. There are a couple of hundred knock each, these units. Once it's behind the switch, you can do everything digitally. Lights on, lights off. This one's green, which means it's a dimmer. So you can dim your lights. The cool thing is the switch still works. So when other people come to your house and they don't know about all your tricky voice commands, they can push the switch on the wall and it still works. This was kind of part of my, my goal for the home automation. My parents are very good with light switches, decades of experience. I want to make sure that they can come to the house and still turn the lights on and off. And that's what these ones do. Another cool one, proximity sensors. So the way the proximity sensors work is they're a reed switch, which means they're a magnetically actuated switch. The little one is a magnet. The big one is the IoT unit. It also communicates over Zigbee. When they're together, the circuit closes and something is shut. For example, a door is shut. When they're apart, the circuit opens and it raises an event. So now you can start to do things based on the state of a door. And finally, but not exhaustively, because there are thousands and thousands of devices you can integrate, is Sonos. Now, we've got Sonos throughout our house. Got those in-ceiling ones, got Play 5 on the desk, got a Move somewhere. They all integrate into Home Assistant, and you can then use Home Assistant to do text-to-speech. So just through code, you can start to look at different states around the house, raise events, and get your house to talk. That opens up some wonderful opportunities. My wife, Charlotte, is perfect in every way, <laughs> except one. <laughs> when she wants a drink of water, she'll go to the cupboard, and she'll open the cupboard, and she'll take the glass, and she'll just walk away. <laughs> and the door is sitting there, open, by some force of nature that was unclear to her. But we have a smart house. So 
here's the fix. You can create an automation using YAML, yet another markup language. Automation looks like this. You give it a unique identifier and you give it a friendly name. And I want to send an alert if a kitchen cupboard door is left open. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to have a trigger. In this case, it's looking at the state platform. And if the binary sensor, so it's either on or off, door shut, door is open. If it goes from off to on, which means the door is now open, that raises an event. But how long is long enough? How long is reasonable? Because we don't want to be unfair, right? 15 seconds. If it's open <laughs> for more than 15, that's enough, right? We've all used cupboard doors before. We know how they work. So what we do then is we have an action. And I'm going to get the Sonos to speak and say, Charlotte, or somebody else, because I didn't want to single her out, <laughs> please close the kitchen. And this is amazing. You can do this with code. Who wants to see how it works? Of course you do. But Charlotte, or somebody else, please close the kitchen cupboard door. <laughs> <laughs> You're a dickhead. <laughs> and the door is now shut. <laughs> you can use these anywhere. There are many practical applications. We, uh, we eventually decided it was actually easier to rip out the kitchen and build a new one with self-closing doors. <laughs> So I've repurposed the binary sensor. Now tooling, let's go to tooling. We get huge amounts of leverage in our industry out of tooling. The things that we can do with digital technology that builds our tools is absolutely unprecedented. And it's, it's not new either. So we've always been at the forefront of innovation in our industry. Who was sending email in the 80s? Ah, okay, yep, me either. <laughs> so that's, that's just a record show. Maybe there was one person at the back. Maybe that was Richard or someone. I don't know. Uh, email is obviously a fairly new thing for most of us, but we were sending email in the 80s, and that was amazing leverage at the time. There's a little video here from, uh, from the BBC. They used to have a segment where they talk about new and emerging technology. They're talking about email here. Now, what's really fascinating about this video is listen to how many times they say how simple it is. With the assistance of the outside broadcast unit, we will be linking from the database studio to their home. Pat Green and Julian, welcome to database. Hello, Jane. Hello, Jane. Now, Julian, I see you have your computer linked to the telephone line. Can you tell us how you did that? Yes, well, it's very simple, really. Um, the telephone is connected to the telephone network with a British Telecom plug, and I simply remove the telephone jack from the telecom socket and plug it into this box here, the modem. I then take another wire from the modem and plug it in where the telephone was. I can then switch on the modem and we're ready to go. Um, the computer asked me if I want to log on and it's now telling me to phone up the main press cell computer, which I will now do. Um, so it's a very simple connection to make. Extremely simple. Um, and I can actually leave the modem pl plugged in once it's done that without affecting the telephone. I'm now waiting for the computer to answer me. It asks with a tone, and then I just flick a switch on the modem and replace the receiver. And... Things are starting to happen. Things are starting to happen. Nothing has happened. <laughs> he hasn't even started to write the email yet. But 40 years ago, this would have seemed like magic. And it's like that saying you've probably all heard, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. This was amazing. And it's a little bit like the Arthur C. Clarke video, which was 20 years before this, where he's like, look, you can be anywhere in the world. And you can communicate with people regardless of location. So we got huge leverage out of tooling in the technology industry. And of course, these days, what we're doing with tooling is really, really rapidly changing. So let's talk about the AI thing. Have I Been Pwned had its 10th birthday in December. And I thought, oh, what would be nice is to make a cake. But because it's a digital service, obviously, it's going to be a digital cake. Let's make an image of a cake. 
So I went to ChatGPT and said, look, uh, have I been pwned as having its 10th birthday? Please make me a cake. And it came back with this, which was amazing because it knew already that have I been pwned was in the cybersecurity in uh, industry. So I get like padlocks and stuff like that. It knew that I had all of these blue themes on the website. So I get blue icing. It knew it was the 10th birthday, so it gave me 14 candles. And, <laughs> and this is what we see constantly happen as well. I'm sure we've all done this, right? Gone in and created an image. That the fascinating thing I find is that it just seems to never be able to spell <laughs> as well. It's like I've literally typed out, have I been pwned? And I get these crazy words. And I think what we're finding to be especially fascinating at the moment is how often things that are AI related are confidently wrong. It's the term we keep hearing, confidently wrong. Remember the Australia image earlier on with the koala roo in the tree? <laughs> right? I mean, it's funny when I was looking at it originally, I was like, we do have animals in Australia that are effectively made up from other bits. So maybe a platypus, maybe that's just confusing the AI and it's like, I don't know, maybe it has a tail. Give it a go. We hear the term a lot, AI hallucinations. The AI believing something, thinking it's seen something, it knows something, and then reflecting that back to us. So it's becoming the challenge now for us to determine what is the hallucination versus the reality. I thought I'd have another go, and I'd go to Copilot and ask for a realistic image of Australia 200 years ago. Now, I picked 200 years ago because that wasn't too long after British colonialization. And I knew that would be a little bit controversial, so let's see what it comes up with. And I had images in my mind of what Copilot might create to try and reflect an Australia of 200 years ago. But never in my wildest dreams did I think it would create this. <laughs> it's a giraffe and a bear and an elephant. In Australia, 200 years ago, in modern history, if it had been like 2 billion years ago, I don't know how far back it goes, but something like that, yeah, some really big number, you would have gone, oh, maybe they were the, all the land masses were joined and they walked across. But no, 200 years ago. And the thing that comes to mind with this, it's a little bit like sometimes at the moment we're hearing people say, and it'll be one of these sensationalist news articles, you know, is AI going to replace your job in the same way as in the Industrial Revolution? Are the machines going to replace your job? And the reality of it is they, they change our jobs. And I think we've got to really look at it as, as a tool. And it's like any other tool that we have available to us. You know, think about a physical tool. The tool itself is there to help you be more efficient. But if you don't know how to use the tool properly, it's not going to help you be better <laughs> at what it is that you do. That's a hammer drill <laughs> for those of you that aren't into hardware. There are obviously really fascinating, very productive uses of AI. And I'm finding for me, one of the things I use it the most for uh, is, is stuff like this. Like I know that if I write some TSQL and I get a result set and I want to take a column out of each row and I want to throw it against the stored procedure, I know I can't just do that in line. I know that I need to use a cursor. And I know this because I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times over the last few decades. I've got the code somewhere. Uh, it's actually much easier to go into the likes of ChatGPT and go, hey, just generate me the code. But just as I'm going to validate any images it creates, I'm going to validate that code. I'm going to read every single line of what it creates. I know from memory there's a statement, you select that into some variables, there's a loop you have to get into next, and at some point you deallocate something. And if I can see that and test that and validate that myself, I'm happy, that's good. Trust but verify is the old term that comes to mind. GitHub Copilot, probably lots of people using that these days. This is, again, one of these things that is fascinating for productivity. It is not going to replace us, certainly not the way it works today. But last week when I was in there writing some code to integrate into Stripe and I needed to pull back a customer from Stripe and I was in a class dealing with Stripe things. And as soon as I started writing my method, and said, I want to get myself a customer. It's like, yeah, here you go. I was like, wow, geez, that looks pretty good. Again, read it. You have a look at it and go, yep, yep, yep. That's not going to delete the database. That, <laughs> that looks OK. Let's run with that. And it was beautiful. It was exactly what I needed. 
There are more than 20 talks tagged AI at NDC this year. So go and see those talks because those of us who can find ways to use it more productively can do amazing things. It is absolutely fascinating. I do fear that we start to AI everything. We think that either everything needs AI or we start attributing everything to AI. And I'll give you an example of that that comes back to data breaches. Europe Car. Everyone knows Europe Car. They are a massive international brand. They definitely have my data. I've hired cars from before. Earlier this year, this appeared on a popular hacking forum. 50 million Europe Car customers. City of birth, city of issuance, passport number, names, driver's license numbers. This is really, really volatile stuff in terms of personal data. And 50 million Europe car records would be a very relevant data set for Have I Been Pwned. So I was particularly curious. I downloaded the data and had a look at it. And while I'm looking at it, you start to see press and discussions come out about whether or not it's legitimate. Because this is the thing. Turns out you can't always trust hackers posting data to criminal forums. So <laughs> it's a little bit like AI, trust but verify. You have to go and look and figure out whether it's legit. Now, Europecar looked at it and they said, uh, someone likely used ChatGPT to promote a fake data breach. And at the time, I, I sort of looked at it and I'd seen the data and I went, how do you figure? Like, how, how, is, this, how is this AI? What was the conclusion that drew you to AI? Tell you what, go into ChatGPT and say, could you please generate me a whole bunch of personal data that looks like a data breach? And it's like, no, you can't do that. You know, I have standards. I don't want to give you that. So it kind of bugged me to see that what I thought at the time was misattribution to AI. But I was busy, so I left it. And then the next day I got this email from Sleazy PR Firm. That's their official name <laughs> from now on. This was a PR firm that wanted to ship around a security company's hot take on what the Europe Car data breach was. And they said, the incident was like a Scooby-Doo plot. Now that immediately had me fascinated because I like Scooby-Doo. So I wanted to have a look at what is it that they think makes this Scooby-Doo. And in their description, they said it was a classic Scooby-Doo unmasking and then in the space for a couple of hours, the InfoSec community went from analyzing the impact of one of the biggest data breaches of all times, uh, not really, anyway, to exposing an AI-powered hoax. Now, this was just one small part of the whole thing. And what happens is InfoSec companies create some material, they go to PR companies, and then they effectively go just spam everyone you can find to ship around our hot take. The InfoSec company did have an AI product, which probably explains their interest in it. I'm going to show you the data, and let's see if we can figure out if this is AI or not. What do you reckon? Is anyone here from uh, Lukeburg? Been to Lisa Town? These are weird names, aren't they? And the reason I took both the city and the city of birth is originally I was giving them the benefit of the doubt. I was like, maybe it's real. And then if we get these two columns, you're bound to have some people who still live in the city in which they were born. That would make sense. That would help us establish the legitimacy of the data. Instead, what we seem to have here is a list of people's names and a list of suffixes. And some code somewhere has gone and just concatenated the two of them together. Now, does that make it AI? Has anyone ever done like string.join? Well, that's my AI done. <laughs> it's like, happy days. So what we eventually discovered is that this was created by PHP Live. It's called PHP Faker. It's got more than 6 million downloads a month. And it literally just does string concatenation. So I feel like we're always come sort of full circle on the AI thing. It creates a lot of weird stuff that we have to validate. It does some really awesome stuff that we need to learn how to use better. And don't trust everyone who says there's AI in everything. And we're back to, again, the trust but validate. Now with that, I'm going to leave you with one last message I recorded just before I left home. I really appreciate you all having me back here at NDC. Norway is like a second home for me now. As such, I've put a lot of work into my Norwegian lately, 
and wanted to leave you with a brief message. Velkommen alle sammen til NDC 2025. Du kommer til at se nogle fantastiske foredrag de næste dage, og jeg håber de hjælper dig med at hage dig til toppen. If you reckon that was good, wait until you hear my Arabic. إذا كنت من بين الجمهور اليوم ويمكنك فهم هذا بالفعل يرجى الحضور والعثور علي لاحقا وأود أن أقدم لك بعض الملصقات المجانية. Thanks everyone and have an awesome NDC Oslo 2024. Okay, thank you very much everyone.